In this video, you'll be learning about critical thinking. When it's done, you should be able to describe what critical thinking means, recognize the difference between analysis and evaluation, recount some common problems and arguments, and convey the self-reflective dimension of critical thinking. The term critical thinking has become a buzzword on college campuses. Like any term that gets widely used, it has come to mean different things to different people. Often, it is meant simply to indicate careful or systematic thinking. However, critical thinking is actually a field of study and has a very specific meaning for those who write and teach about it. To help you understand this scholarly definition of critical thinking, it will be useful to explain a few fundamental concepts. First, think about the types of things you say when you communicate with other people. When you're talking with your parents, texting your friends, or writing a paper, your words can be broken down into pieces that have different purposes. Sometimes you say something to express your preferences, like, I would like strawberry ice cream. Other times you may make a joke, hoping to get a laugh. But often, when we communicate, we are making a claim about the world. We might say, strawberry ice cream is healthier than chocolate. Or, people shouldn't eat ice cream. Or we might say humans are causing global warming. Or we should pass a global warming treaty. These claims are the focus of critical thinking. People who don't think critically generally believe any claim that is put in front of them, or they believe the last claim they heard. But a critical thinker will not accept a claim without first analyzing the reasons that are given in support of the claim and then evaluating whether those reasons are adequate. Let's take a closer look at those two key activities, analysis and evaluation. When critical thinkers analyze a claim, they specify the claim or conclusion that is being made and delineate all of the reasons that are given to support the claim. The conclusion, combined with supporting reasons, constitute an argument. Analysis involves describing what this argument is. For example, imagine a writer has made a claim that the death penalty should be eliminated. The writer may have provided several reasons. He may have noted that innocent people could be killed, as demonstrated by the recent exonerations of death row inmates using DNA evidence. The writer might also argue that it violates moral respect for human life, and he might also provide statistics showing that the crime rate is actually higher in states with the death penalty and then infer that the death penalty does not deter crime. Analyzing arguments well takes study and practice because often speakers or writers don't do a good job of showing us the structure of their arguments. For instance, they may leave the conclusion implied rather than explicitly stated. They may spend four paragraphs on one supporting reason but then squeeze three reasons into one sentence. So the first step in critical thinking is to make the argument clear by analyzing it. The next step is evaluation. Evaluation involves judging how well the arguments support the claim. It means assessing the quality of the argument. If an argument is found inadequate, a critical thinker will reject the claim being made. This is the real purpose of critical thinking constructing an evaluative filter that keeps out shoddy claims. Even more than analysis, evaluation is a skill that one needs to study and work on. In a college course on critical thinking, most of the time is spent identifying problems that tend to turn up over and over again in the arguments people make. One very common problem is faulty statistical evidence. Let's look at our capital punishment example again. The writer asserted the death penalty was not a deterrent to crime, and he based that assertion on some statistics showing that the crime rate was higher in states that used the death penalty. If we evaluate this reason carefully, we might point out that this statistic doesn't really show a lack of deterrent effect. It may very well be the case that the crime rate in those states with the death penalty would be much higher if they didn't use capital punishment. In addition to hunting for faulty statistical evidence, evaluation involves finding other common problems. Becoming a good critical thinker means developing skills in identifying these problems in people's arguments. 
With practice, anyone can become a skilled critical thinker. But critical thinking is more than just having a lot of skill at analysis and evaluation. It also means being in the habit of using those skills to think critically. Critical thinking is kind of like a mental predisposition. Critical thinkers automatically engage their filter whenever they hear someone make a claim, whether it's an ad on TV, a friend trying to persuade you about something, or a scholarly argument in a textbook. But perhaps the most important claims that critical thinkers evaluate are their own. While critical thinking is an important way to keep out bad claims made by others, true critical thinking is self-reflective. All of us have strong opinions and beliefs about the world. When we are true critical thinkers, we analyze and evaluate those opinions and beliefs as rigorously as the claims of others. And we are open to changing our deeply held beliefs if we realize that the arguments to support them are weak. This kind of self-reflection is probably the hardest part of critical thinking, but it also offers the greatest reward. When we have genuinely evaluated our own beliefs, we can feel great confidence that we've discovered true knowledge of the world.